I'm about to share with you an approach to studying the book of Revelation that will definitely change your outlook and your ability to understand the book without becoming frustrated. In this video, I'll share with you five things that you need to know about Revelation in order to get to better understand it. This video is a general introduction to the entire book, but if you need specific help on a particular vision or chapter, you can post it in the chat and I'll see what I can do to address that. Now, if you have not yet done so, I'm inviting you to subscribe to the channel so that you can get up-to-date information when we post new videos. Thank you very much. Welcome back. Now, up front, I must let you know that studying the book of Revelation is not very different from the way you study other books of the Bible. The basic principle behind Bible study is what is called hermeneutics. A big word, but it simply means taking the scripture to understand what the author meant to his original audience and try to interpret it for your time. Okay? That is still the approach that you take to understand Revelation. There's a slight difference with Revelation, which I'll tell you in a little while. But the reason some people become frustrated is because they, they overlook the need to do hermeneutics or exegesis, and they focus more on trying to unlocking these symbols. All right? We're going to tell you the role of the symbols and how to approach them. I'm going to tell you how to approach exegesis in the book of Revelation. These principles that I'm gonna share with you is not a quick fix for getting to unlock the symbols. It is setting you on a path to understanding the book on your own, um, mostly. Once you get these principles, you can, it's, I'm giving you studying skills that will get you into the book, okay? So the five things that you need to understand about the book of Revelation or the five things that you need to understand in order to understand the book of Revelation are, first of all, you need to understand the literary context of the book. You also need to understand how to exegete the book. You need to look at the literary structure of the book of Revelation, how it is structured. You will need a basic history of the Christian church. And I think this is one key that most persons don't realize. You, you, you cannot understand Revelation without understanding the history of the Christian church because the book of Revelation relates directly to the history of the church from the time of the Jews until today. And finally, to understand the book, you need to know the historical or the historicist method of interpreting apocalyptic prophecy. We're gonna get right into these steps. Okay, so let's start with the literary structure of Revelation. The book of Revelation falls within the category of what is referred to as apocalyptic prophecies. Apocalyptic prophecies are unique to other types of prophecies. And there are two major types of prophecies in the Bible. You have the what is referred to as a classical prophecy and apocalyptic prophecy. The classical prophecy is what we are used to. We are a prophet like Isaiah or Jeremiah or like Jonah. They receive a message from God that is specific to their generation for the purpose of correcting moral issues. So their main duty is to get the people in their time to turn to God and to and to surrender their lives to him. And while they prophesy to the people to call out their sins, to, to present God's word, they also sometimes present a prediction of the future um, in two ways. Sometimes in typology, um, I'm sorry for using that big word, sometimes in a messianic prophecy, where they, what they announce becomes a, a representation of what will happen when the Messiah comes. So they, they, they have a dual role. They speak to the people in their time, and, and what they say may have dual application to another time. For example, the, the experience of Isaiah. Isaiah spoke about a virgin who would have a child, and that referred to his wife, and the name of the child would be called Emmanuel. This local prophecy was made to have a dual application, where it also applies to the virgin Mary, who would have a son named Jesus. Another example of, of, of classical prophecies like Jeremiah. Jeremiah prophesied of the Babylon cap 
Babylonian captivity for 70 years and that was fulfilled. He also, along with Isaiah, prophesied of the fall of Babylon. And yes, local Babylon in their time did fall and eventually become uninhabited. The fall of Babylon concept was drawn upon by a later prophet John in the book of Revelation to use as a type for the final day Babylon. So that is how classical prophecies work. Their, the connection that they have with the future is not unconditional. It is, it is basically an interpretation or a reapplication of what they prophesy in their local setting. Apocalyptic prophecies now, on the other hand, while the prophet was addressing local people, these prophecies spoke more directly to the future. And not just about the future, but the future regarding the time from the time of the prophet to the end of the world. Let me repeat that. The apocalyptic prophecies does not just speak to a particular event in the future. Apocalyptic prophecies usually usually covers the series of events that will take place from the time of the prophet to the time of the end or the end of time. Okay, I hope that you grasp that difference. One of the things that may, that, that, that comes as a result of that is that the, while the classical prophecies might be conditional, the, the apocalyptic prophecies are usually unconditional because they are not just stating what God's plans are, they are revealing the future of what exactly how God saw it would happen. Okay, and that's why they, it, it represents the future in an unbroken sequence from the time of the prophet to the end. Examples of apocalyptic prophecies are found in the books of Daniel and Revelation, and some would say the book of Matthew 24. Okay, so the second important thing you need to know to understand the book of Revelation is how to apply the principles of hermeneutics to the book. Okay, just like you do any other book of the Bible, you need to do background checks and so on. So for the book of Revelation in particular, the book was written around about the 90 AD during the reign of Domitian, a, 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 a Roman Empire who severely persecuted the church. The last apostle to die was still alive, John the Apostle. The church was going through severe persecution. And so Jesus wanted to assure the church, the local church there in Asia Minor and other churches of his presence and of his power and his and his continued support of them. So really, the book of Revelation is actually an epistle. Let me, let me make that clear. The book of Revelation is actually an epistle. It is a letter from Jesus to John. And John did say that. You know, sometimes we, we, we just take the book as if it's totally separate from the, from the New Testament. Most of the New Testament is made up of epistles and Revelation is one of them. The other thing about the context of Revelation is the author. The book was written by the Apostle John, okay? Um, he is one of the 12 apostles who followed Jesus and he wrote the Gospel of John, right? Now the unique thing about Revelation that you need to understand is that Revelation does not only speak to local situations because within the letter of Revelation, not only did it assure the people of God's presence amidst their persecution. It also corrected sins that existed right there in Asia Minor. All right, in the first three chapters, Jesus addressed um, moral problems that existed within the church in Asia Minor. But the majority of the book from chapter four onwards dealt with future events, okay? And listen to this, in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1, the Bible says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a tr trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up here, and I will show you things which must be hereafter. So if, if you just take the book as it says, it is speaking about things that are to come. John also repeated the same thing in Revelation chapter 1, where he says in verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. Okay, so John is making it clear that the book of Revelation is about the future. Let's let that settle. 
what makes Revelation unique though is that while Jesus spoke about the future, he used language and symbols that are that belong to the time of John. Okay? So that creates a situation where the people of John's time did not fully understand the events that are, are going to come, but they fully understood the symbols that John used to represent those things. I hope you got that. Let me repeat it. The book of Revelation spoke about things of the future, but Jesus and the apostle John used symbols and icons that John and the people in Asia Minor could understand. So what you have is a situation where the people understood the symbols, but they didn't understand the events. We today find ourselves in a situation where we know the events for the most part, but we don't understand the symbols. Okay? Let me repeat that again. So we today, as we look at Revelation, we, we understand the events that these symbols represent but we don't understand the symbols and so it creates a challenge so what we have is a situation where in order for us to bridge that gap we have the events we know what's happening in our world we know what's happening in history as i said as i'll share with you that we need to understand the history of the church to understand revelation but the symbols are far removed from us because they do not they do not speak to our culture. So really, we are still to apply the basic principle of exegesis by going to John's culture and finding out what these symbols meant to John. And then we can now take it and apply it to the events that we face today and throughout the history of the church. Now, just before I move away from the topic of exegesis, you might be wondering, so where does John get his symbols from? Because... The point I've been trying to make is that the people in John's time would have understood exactly what he was talking about. When he talked about beasts, the seven angels, um, you know, all of those things they would have been able to identify with. But where did John get those symbols from? There are four, four sources I would suggest to you regarding where John took his language from. Number one is from the Old Testament a major chunk of information that is found in, Re in Revelation is taken from Old Testaments, Old Testament symbols and icons and people. So for example, just off the bat, um, you have Jezebel, you have Balaam, you have Moses, you have Elijah. All of those, those persons are taken from Old Testament symbolism. Matter of fact, based on the record, two thirds of the Bible text, scripture in Revelation contain symbols from the Old Testament. All right, so you need to know the Old Testament to truly understand the symbols in Revelation. The second source that John would get symbolism from is from Jewish apocalyptic literature. These are apocalyptic literature that were not included in the canon, but they, they form part of Jewish literature. For example, the book of Enoch, and, and, and those other books which contain apocalyptic visions but are not a part of scripture. John, in his mind, would have borrowed symbolism from these, not necessarily borrowed doctrine from these, but the symbolism um, were in his head. The third source of information for John is Asia Minor culture or Greco-Roman culture. If you understand a little about the culture that John lived in, it will help you also. And finally, John would have also have gotten language from the New Testament church. You know, so right there within the book of uh, books of the New Testament, John would have pulled on concepts that he would have gotten there. All right? So that covers the idea of basic ex exegesis of the book of Revelation. The third thing that you need to get about the book of Revelation, you know, to understand it, is how it is structured. Okay? Uh, what, what I mean by structure is that each author of the Bible has a way, a unique way of presenting their content. 
whether they present it as a letter, as a poem, and the way they format that poem or that um, narrative. The Book of Revelation has several different structures. The first structure is what is referred to by Stefanovich as the future and present structure. John was told to write two basic things, what he sees now and what he's about to see. And theologians divide Revelation into two parts where the first three chapters dealt with matters relating to the present, relating to the church in Asia Minor, but out of chapter four, the rest of that relate to the future. That's the first basic structure. The second basic structure is that within the, um, the future events, you find that as of chapter 12, there is more emphasis on last day events. So the, the visions do not go back to John's time um, as the first couple of visions do, but these visions focusing, focuses on last day events that is in connection with the prophecy of Daniel. I won't go too deep into that because it's a difficult concept right now. I explained it in another video which you can watch. The third basic structure of Revelation is that Revelation contains seven, seven visions. Um, some, of them, some of them are parallel, while others, as I said, relate to last day events, but it's seven basic visions. So, you know, when you're, trying, when you're reading it, you have to take each vision by themselves. And the visions, they, they span different chapters. So Revelation is not, is not a book to be read chapter by chapter. You need to read it vision by vision. The final important structure to pay attention to is that the book of Revelation uses a lot of sanctuary language, okay? So the Old Testament sanctuary service finds resonance in the book of Revelation. And the way it is presented is that it helps to divide the book. So for example, again, Stephanovich shows you that for each vision, in the book of Revelation, there's an opening sanctuary scene, okay? Each vision in the book of Revelation has a opening sanctuary scene. So for example, the first vision of the, church, of the seven churches, we see Jesus walking amid the seven golden candlesticks. That's a sanctuary opening. Then you have the vision of the seals. You have the vision of the throne of God and of the lamb who was slain in the midst of the throne. That represents sanctuary language. Then before the vision of the, the trumpets, we have the vision of the, of the angels standing at the altar of incense, burning incense with the prayers of the saints. That's coming from the sanctuary. Then we have, before we have the vision of Revelation 12 to 14, the vision of the opening up of the heavenly tabernacle, the most holy place is now open, and we see the Ark of the Covenant. Then, before the vision of the seven plagues, the temple is opened again, but this time, there is no intercession going on. And then, when the temple opens again, we see the Son of Man coming to take his people in Revelation 19. And when, he, when it is finally opened, in the book of Revelation chapter 21, we see that there is no temple there. I guess that would have meant that all the salvation process is now end, are now ended and God finally dwells with his people. The Bible tells us that God um, is a temple. There's no need for any more temple. All right, so that's a very important structure to keep in mind, that each vision begins with a sanctuary scene. Another important concept that you need to get regarding the study of Revelation are the different views and approaches that different individuals and organizations take when studying Revelation. There are four of them, four popular ones. The first one is the futurist view that suggests that the book of Revelation contains visions that relate only to the future, the end time events. Then you have also the preterist view which suggests that Revelation only relates to the past and you have the idealist view which suggests that Revelation does not relate to any historical event at all but have words of encouragement and inspiration that the Christian can benefit from. We adopt the historicist view that is a balance between the futurist and the preterist where we believe that the book of Revelation and the visions of Revelation relate to events that starting with the time of John 
goes to the end of the world. The final thing that you need to understand about Revelation to get a good grasp of it is that you need to do a little reading into the basic history of the Christian church. All right, it's, it's very important. It's gonna be difficult for you to maneuver and get the symbols without understanding that. A good book to get a good grasp on the history of the Christian church is a book, Great Controversy by Ellen G. White. I believe it is a very good summary of the history of the church. And once you read that book, then you can go off into other more deeper history because most of the history books are very difficult to read in terms of the length of it. But the book Great Controversy supplies a very concise but very accurate history of the Christian church. So those are my five tips for getting you started with the book of Revelation. I Once I share these tips with other persons, I find that they have really appreciated it and their outlook changes. Now, if you're still watching this video, I really want to express appreciation to you for staying with this video. And I want you again to, to remind you to put your in the chat your section of Revelation, your vision of Revelation, that you have a challenge understanding. And I'll try my best to, to address that vision as soon as possible. Thank you for watching and God bless you.